Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here from EdChat Interactive, and I'm pretty happy to report that I have electricity. And uh, so I'm back in my home office. And uh, welcome to EdChat Interactive, where we're talking about leading personalized learning with Nancy Mangum and, oops, um, uh, <laughs> I had the wrong names up there, but, um, and uh, Mary Ann. Um, uh, Nancy and Mary Ann wrote the book on leading personalized and digital learning, and they're going to be leading the discussion today. Uh, and let me just explain a little bit about EdChat Interactive and a little bit about um, the platform we're using. Our goal tonight is to have a discussion. So this is not as a, a typical webinar where somebody's going to get up there and talking the slides like I'm doing now. Um, it's going to be more like uh, presenting a little bit of information and then letting you discuss the information and come up on stage and sharing your thoughts about it. Uh, we think that that's much more in, in line with the way people and adults especially learn. Um, it allows you to interact. It allows you to reflect. It allows you to participate. And we're doing that uh, because we're using a platform called Shindig, which is a unique platform for this, this type of event. It allows you to interact in quite a few different ways. Uh, one of the ways is through text chatting. And let me just expand this for a, for a second, uh, just so that you can see the slide a little bit better. Uh, this is kind of a screen capture of when when I was doing an Itchet Interactive a, 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 a little bit a while ago. But you see that under your avatar, uh, there's a menu. And uh, some of the more important parts of this menu are text chat, ask question, and raise hand. Um, so text chat is what allows you to text with the other people who are here. So I'd like to encourage you to click on text chat right now. What that's going to do is that's going to open up a window like this on your screen. Now, uh, if you grab the top of the window, you can move it. If you grab the lower right-hand corner, you can size it. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is with that window up, why don't you introduce yourself to the other people who are here? Um, and, um, and maybe even uh, type in something that you'd like to learn tonight or something that you've not liked about professional development in the past. And uh, the moderators uh, will be able to see that. Um, the, your fellow students, your fellow participants will be able to see that also. And you can comment on what somebody else said. Uh, the one person who cannot see that is me. So you can say whatever you want to about me in that text chat, and I won't be able to see it. Um, the second way to interact is to ask questions. Now, when you click on the ask question uh, menu item, that's something that goes directly to me. If it's a question for Nancy or Marianne Wolf, um, I will pass it on to them. Um, but um, other, otherwise, uh, if it's a technical question, uh, you can ask it directly of me and I can, I can answer it. But so the second way of interacting is to ask questions. And the third way of, and I see somebody has asked a question, so I'm going to get to that in a second. The third way of interacting is by clicking on that raise hand avatar. And that says that you need my attention. Uh, I think we're going to be using that a few times because, uh, Nancy and Marianne are going to be asking, um, gee, you know, can somebody come up and talk about where this might apply? Or can somebody talk about what you guys talked about in small groups? And if you click on the raise hand avatar, the raise hand icon, that lets me know that, you, that you're willing to come up on stage and talk in front of people. So let me just see now, okay. Ah, um, there's a question um, that's no question, just giving this a whirl. Um, uh, so yes, they, the, the questioning works. Um, so let me let me move on to uh, the third way of interacting, and that is you see avatars of other people who are here tonight, and if you click on the avatar of another person and you have a webcam and that other person has a webcam, you're going to be able to have a private conversation with that other person. Are you going to be able to form small groups and have a talk? And we're going to be doing that a couple times this evening. And um, normally what we would do 
is we would ask you to do that right now. Click on somebody's avatar, introduce yourself, talk about what you hope to learn, find out what they hope to learn. But um, knowing uh, Nancy and Marianne, uh, they have a lot of information to go through tonight. And we're going to be doing this a couple times tonight. So rather than doing that now, uh, when it comes time for them to do it, I'll pop back out up on the screen and we'll go through how to do that with you. So um, I, um, oh, you know something? That's why this, these, this is from the last slides. Um, uh, I will say <laughs> we do have some, some really interesting sessions coming up. Uh, if you go to www.edgeheadinteractive.org, you'll find them. Um, I tried to do these slides really rapidly since I didn't have electricity today and I rushed through it and I guess it shows. Uh, but we are having some uh, some interesting discussions. There's a, there's a discussion coming up in two weeks, uh, which is, I think, hopefully um, you'll find it fascinating also. It's going to be on um, what a black educator hope wishes that white educators knew about children of color. And that's going to be a discussion also. So um, I think whether you're black, brown, yellow, red, white, whatever your color is, it's really um, fascinating to hear what people of other races or other cultures, um, how they wish to be addressed, what their fears are, what their hopes are. And I think you'll find out that in the end analysis, we are all people but we all need to be treated a little bit differently. So if you go to www.edshadinteractive.org, you can find that and please uh, sign up. So without further ado though, let me, um, let me select their slides and um, let me bring uh, Mary Ann and Nancy up. Uh, let, me find, let me find them first. Okay, there's Nancy, and I'm going to bring Nancy up. And then... And let me bring Marianne up, too. Hi, everyone. And, hey, Nancy. How are Hello. you? And Mitch, no worries, because I, I was going to say Shayla, Marianne, and I all work so closely together that, um, you know, whether it was Shayla or Marianne, or myself here tonight. Um, hopefully, you get some good. No, um, I'm sorry. It was my, good, you know. Anyhow, no, it, we. It we, happened. We work closely and, together. And here it is, International Day of the Woman, and I messed up. I mean, it's typical for a guy to mess up on the day of the. I could have messed. I could have messed up on 365 other days of the year, and I messed up on the day of the woman. So, um, so I'm sorry. No, so I think what no. I'm going to, yeah. So anyhow, Marianne, well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. I think what I'll do is I'll bring myself down and I'll expand your slides so that people can see them better. And uh, just call me up when you need, it, you know, if by any chance you need me. Okay, great. Um, well, hi everybody. I'm Marianne Wolf, and I am with the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation, and we are actually at NC State University in Raleigh, North Carolina, although Nancy nor I are in Raleigh tonight um, as we join you. Um, we are really excited to talk about a topic that is near and dear to our heart, but also one I think where we're constantly trying to push ourselves and also learn um, from others, so we're delighted to be with you. Um, I have been a teacher, and I've worked with districts and schools across the country for a very, very long time. And I think always with that aim of how do we meet the needs of more kids every day. And so what I think we talk about learners a lot because we don't want to, we know that the kids are so, so important, but we don't want to forget the educators as well in that statement. And so tonight we'll dive into the adults um, and how we can personalize learning for them. Nancy? Yes, thanks, Mary Ann, and I'm glad to be here with um, with Mary Ann today. Um, Mary Ann and I get the great opportunity to work with schools and districts, um, both across North Carolina but around the country. And um, the focus, um, Mary Ann and I, although our team works with both teachers as well as school leaders, um, Mary Ann and I focus in our work really um, focuses on instructional coaches, principals, and district leaders. And so we're excited to share with you all tonight. Um, just a quick little bit about the Friday Institute. We are part of the College of Education at NC State University. And um, the Friday Institute, the mission is to improve K-12 education through innovations. And so a lot of the innovations focus in around digital, 
but um, personalized learning is um, especially near and dear to Marianne and my heart. And um, as we look at um, personalizing learning and those K-12 innovations, um, the Friday Institute really focuses in on that combining research, policy, and practice. And so we spend a lot of our a lot of our time with educators, although we do work at a university and we're, you know, we like to bring in research into everything we do, um, we spend um, the majority of our time with educators. So tonight, um, during our time together, we'll, we'll take a look at um, what makes effective professional learning and um, look at a, some opportunities to create more meaningful professional learning and consider, consider how we might be able to personalize that more for um for the teachers, educators that that we work with. So on the next slide, you'll you'll see there's a great quote by Todd Rose. And if um, I'm not sure if you're if you're familiar with Todd Rose, but he's um, a Harvard professor and um, has a great TED talk and a, a lot of work around the myth of averages. And we can probably put a a, a link to that in the chat. Um, but I love this quote from him: um, "Human beings don't line up perfectly. There is no average learner." They all have strengths and weaknesses. They all do. Even geniuses do. And um, in Todd Rose's Myth of Averages, he talks about how the, um, the Air Force used to design airplanes for the average human being. And um, so you had to be average in order to be able to fly an airplane. But then they began to realize that no one was really average, that, um, that everyone, you know, even if, we're, even if people were the same height, they had different arm lengths and different leg lengths. And, um, and so it's a really great analogy, I think, as we think about, um, and, and, and so the, the Air Force had to design more adjustable equipment in order to meet the average man or the average woman. And so um, I think that Todd, Todd Rose does a great job of helping us understand that even if we try to teach to the middle, we're actually not hitting anyone. Um, and I think that that's important, really important for our students, but like Marianne said, even more important for um, the teachers that, that we work with. So on the next slide, you'll see um, Marianne and I do have um, a little bit of interest in this topic, um, personalized and digital learning. And we've actually written a book that's published by Harvard Press um, called Leading Personalized and Digital Learning, a Framework for Implementing School Change. And in our book, um, we lay out a framework for school leaders and district leaders as they think about implementing this change or the shift in their schools to, to personalize and digital learning. And you'll notice in our framework there, um, there are several things, of course, at the center is creating a vision for teaching and learning. But um, one of our focuses um, around the outside of the framework is personalized professional learning, because we know that that is so important as you move towards that vision for what you want for your students. And so that's what we're going to focus in on tonight um, is personalized professional learning. So on the next slide, you'll notice um, we want you just to think for a minute um, about an effective professional learning experience that, that you've had. Um, and it could have been when you were younger or more recently, but um, I want you to think about what made that professional learning so um, effective. And I want you to kind of brainstorm with someone else in just a minute, um, what, what makes professional learning experiences effective? And so with that, I think you can, if you click on someone else's avatar or picture, you can join them, and it looks like Mitch is coming up to give us a little bit more instructions. But um, once get, Mitch gives us the instructions, you'll join with someone else and think about um, a professional learning share, a professional learning experience that that was effective, and think about those characteristics with your partner okay. or with your group. yeah. So, um, and I'll bring you two down so you can join in with other people also and join in the in the discussion. Okay, so um, there goes Marianne. So she's available, and there goes Nancy. Uh, so this is the time, and I, I saw a couple of you were doing this before. Um, all you have to do is click on the avatar of another person, and if you both have microphones, you can um, you can you can start talking about. So, what what effective professional learning experiences have you had, and what made them effective, and then what themes emerge from that uh, and then hopefully some of you are going to volunteer to come back up on stage with uh, with uh, Marianne and uh, talk about you know some, some of those experiences also so I'm going to bring myself down and um, 
and and hook up with a couple other people and in a couple minutes uh, the three of us will come back up okay good let me bring let me bring Nancy and Mary Ann up and um, so so um, well while Mary Ann is coming up you know I had some time to think about this also and 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 one of the things that that I think really makes good professional development for me is to be personally involved in it is that not to just sit back and listen but to actually participate in it um, we did a I, did, I gave a session at, at South by Southwest earlier this week and um, basically the session was really having people just you know relate their own experience kind of going around the room and then each person then had a question for the panel and the panel just reacted to the questions rather than uh, having slides and I think that that worked really really well also what do you think about that you know being personally involved makes professional development at least for me more meaningful Yes, I definitely agree. And you know, Susan and I were having a great conversation about um, kind of the we do, um, you know, you do, we do model mm -hmm. and um, ah. talking about how, um, you know, w when we do something, you know, or somebody can show something, but then, um, or we do it together as a whole group, but then you do. So the we do, you do model, mm -hmm. um, which is also really nice because if you're modeling that in professional learning, it's also something that, that we want teachers to be doing in their classrooms as well. So, oh, and Nancy, okay. that's a great, um, yeah, because Becky and I were talking as well, and one of the things that she was saying was that opportunity to collaborate with peers, but then also to do something. So actually having time to do something with it, because so often I think um, we go back into our daily lives and they're so busy, we don't actually have time. And so within the professional learning experience, what can you do with it? So um, I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, of great conversations going on. Um, you know, when we talk about professional learning, um, I think, you know, what we notice is there's a really strong base for why it matters. And um, there, you know, there's a, a slide we have up there that talks about the importance of, you know, teacher quality is the single most important school related factor for student um, learning. And so and leadership is the second most important factor. Um, and I think it's a couple slides after that, um, just so you all can see the sources as well. Um, and so when we think about should we be investing in professional learning and what matters, I think we're always going back to we really need professional learning um, to be excellent so that teachers can be as effective as possible, but also we can't forget leaders. And so I think in our world, we spend a lot of time also talking about if we want leaders that can support teachers to do the things they're learning and that they want to do to improve learning for kids, we need leaders to have an understanding of that as well. Um, I'm sure that many of you, like many of us, um, this next slide actually shows um, an example. This is something from North Carolina from the Digital Learning Plan, where we're moving from this traditional model to a digital age learning model. And I think you could also say personalized learning model at the top there. And the reason we like to share this is because there isn't one way or one model that we're trying to get to, but instead there are so many factors and really there's almost a continuum on every single line here of where you can be. But when we think about all the things we're asking teachers and administrators to understand and do, we need to make sure we're actually giving them opportunities to learn, to practice, and then to implement and ideally with coaching to make that happen. The other thing I think we're keenly aware of, we often start talking with principals and say, how many of you knew you signed up to be organizational change agents? And you know, there's been one room where like one person raised their hand, but when you think about it in the world, um, our leaders are there to help that organizational shift. Not that everything's broken, but really things are moving so fast and we know we need to meet the needs of our kids in, in different ways. But also we have so many more opportunities to do that than before. Um, so what I love, so we, we like to set the ground with that, like there's a reason why this matters so much. Um, but as you'll notice, we actually did point out the research about effective professional learning on this next slide because you all described, oh, I'm sorry, there's the Nosters model. I should have oh, hinted at yeah. that. You know, Marianne, just one thing I want to point out about Nosters model, just like you said, yeah. um, you know, sometimes we wonder, um, and so I'm not, I think we've, We've shared this in other webinars, but um, just so that people are 
aware, like, so Noster says that um, in order for success to happen in managing change, that all of the things along the top have to be in place. So you have to have a vision, there has to be skills, incentives, resources, and an action plan in order to have that successful change. But you'll notice down where skills are missing, there's often anxiety. And so I think as we think about professional learning, this is a really important thing to think about, that if teachers don't have the skills that they need to make the change um, or make the shifts in in practices that, that we want to see, there's often a lot of anxiety. And with anxiety comes a whole host of other things. But um, I just think that that's important to kind of point out. So just wanted to jump in there and, and kind of point and that out. That, and I think another one of our colleagues will often say, what if you're missing two of these things? So what if you don't have a strong action plan and your teachers don't feel like they have the skills they need? Well, you have false starts and anxiety. And you can imagine what that feels like in a building. And often I think with how much gets pushed down to educators, um, it's not far-fetched to say that happens. And so um, really thinking about that and highlighting that. And if you do feel a lot of anxiety in your building, kind of backwards mapping, well, wait, do people have the skills they need and how do we do that? Um, so thank you, Nancy, for, for flagging that. And you know, one of the things that was great about our brief conversations earlier is, is you all were describing what made professional learning effective for you. When you look on this next slide, you're going to see that really what you were doing was telling us what the research says. And so this is from Linda Darling Hammond and Learning Forward, and it's tried and true, but it talks about how it has to be intensive, ongoing job embedded, focused on student learning, focused on teaching specific curriculum content for educators. It needs to be aligned with school improvement, right? It can't be yet another thing on the side. And the last piece actually about building strong relations came through loud and clear in this conversation. And that was added actually in the most recent research. That wasn't always part of that. So how do we build that network and that relationships? And Nancy and I spend a lot of time working with people over time and over place in order to really create those networks. And so we hope we can create that with you as well. Um, and one thing we know for sure is that the most dangerous breeze when we're doing this is this idea of we've, we've all way. So that after school workshop, teachers are already tired, two hours, throw a lot of stuff at them and then not give them the time and everything else they need. And so um, that next slide is kind of one that we often um, show educators because we want to help them push beyond what they um, always what they always do. Um, and so there's another very important um, aspect of this work that Nancy's going to dive into now. Yeah, so let's talk for a minute. So we know that um, what makes professional effective professional learning, and, and you all mentioned those, many of those things, and we know that professional learning is important so that people we don't have anxiety and that and that we have the success we want to see in the initiatives. Um, but if there is, um, if we can go to the next slide, we need to talk for a minute about a little bit about unlearning. Marianne kind of alluded to this, um, that, um, that, um, about the power of unlearning. And so if, um, I'm going to give you a quick quiz here and, um, I want you to just type into the chat, um, what color is the yield sign. The yield sign as you're driving, um, what color is it? If you'll just type that into the chat. Let's see how they do, Marianne, on this quiz. I know. All right, I see several yellows. Anybody have it? And, and oh, I should tell you, you can't Google it, right? All right, <laughs> if, we to, if we can go to the next slide. Uh. And, um. And then the next, like if we can skip forward, let's see. Many of you mm -hmm. said yellow, but um, actually, in fact, if we look on the next slide, you'll see that the yellow, the that the yield sign is not yellow. In fact, it's been about 30 years since the yield sign was actually yellow. So on the next slide, you'll see the yield sign is actually red and white. And um, so some of you might think, oh, well, in, you know, I live in a rural area and there's actually still yellow, um, yellow yield signs. No, I don't think there are, like it's been many years um, and it's, they are actually red and white. 
but it takes us a really long time to unlearn the things that we learned. And so many of us probably were in driver's ed or at some point learned that the yield sign was yellow. But, um, and so we learned that, but we haven't unlearned um, the fact that it actually is red and white, even though we'd all recognize the yield sign and we know what to do with it. Um, we haven't unlearned that. And, you know, in the medical profession, um, they actually talk about um, ulcers and, well, many things in the medical profession, but in the medical profession, um, a story that, that Marianne and I have, um, have read and learned about is ulcer experts. Um, it actually took them about 15 years to prove that they knew that ulcers aren't actually caused by stress or spicy foods. They're actually caused by bacteria, but it took over 15 years for them. And they had all the scientific evidence, but it took them over 15 years to actually convince, um, other doctors um, and world-renowned ulcer experts that, that this was the case, even by showing them the data. And so I think if it takes 15 years in the medical profession to actually change something, um, it probably takes just as long, if not longer, in education to actually change something. And so as we think about professional learning, sometimes it's important not just to think about what do we want teachers to learn, but what do we need to unlearn? What are the things that in schools we unlearn, you know, or, or that we learned that, you know, when we were in college or even when we first started out, things have changed a lot. I think we would all agree with that. So what do we need to unlearn? And so Marianne, anything else you want to add before we jump into our small groups? No, I think that's really helpful. And also just thinking about, um, I think one of the things, Nancy, that you often share is how often we tell teachers we're going to teach them a new reading program, but they've been teaching reading forever, right? And not always helping them really see the why. And so for me, the unlearning and the why kind of go together is something, you know, we can really think about here. Yes. So, um, you know, and, and I know maybe some of you have had questions. So if you have questions, if you want to raise your hand, we can try to address those questions. But, um, as we think about um, on the next slide, I would love for you to get with a partner or in a small group and talk about what are some things that, that we need to maybe unlearn in our schools and why is this important as we move towards the vision of teaching and learning that, that we want to see. So I'll give you just a couple minutes to kind of get with a partner or get with a group and talk about that. And then again, as we're going through, if you have questions, if you raise your hand, then I think that'll kind of alert us to those questions. Okay, and I'll bring uh, Marianne and Nancy down. So this is another time uh, for you to find another another person and pair up. And um, you know, I'll just it, it, and if you um, if you feel a little bit awkward about doing this, I think you know it's possible that Nancy or Marianne will just click on you anyhow and talk to you. Uh, but you can also use that text box in order to type in your your uh, your thoughts also. So this is where um, you know pair up, uh, talk about, you know, what are some of the things that never, maybe it never even dawned on you that it's something that you need to unlearn and uh, why is this important? I'll bring myself down and uh, we'll come back up in a couple minutes. Okay, it looks like a bunch of you were able to have the, have good, some good discussions. Let me bring up uh, Nancy and, uh, and Marianne. So here comes Nancy and here comes Mary Ann. And I guess while while you two are coming up, you know, as as I was looking at the slide, one of the things that was that was hitting me is that there's there's unlearning. One of we when I was learning about pedagogy and andragogy, one of the things that 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 I was I was learning is that there's there's obviously what you know, and then there's what you know that you don't know. And once you know you don't know something, I mean, that's really the first step to improving because, oh, I don't know this. I just have to, I have to find out. But then there's what you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> and then the fourth, the, the fourth thing is what you think you know, but you're wrong. <laughs> and it's really that, that third and fourth things that are so hard because if you don't even know that you don't know something or if you think you know something and you're wrong, you're not even looking to change. You know, and so that that seems to me, uh, um, you know, 
if we're all, if this economy and if our society is all about being able to rapidly learn things, one of the real keys to rapidly learning things is for us all to be able to quickly figure out that, um, hey, we thought we knew this or we had no idea we needed to learn this, but now we understand we do. And, any, and, any and we were having some really good discussions in, in our small group about mm -hmm. um, sometimes we, um, you know, things like classroom management. That, that was something um, we learned right. how to do when we were in school, but it looks totally different and or you bring in devices and it is very different. So there's a lot of things that um, we need to mm -hmm. unlearn. And, and while we're, we're talking, actually, what I would like to ask is if somebody who was involved in one of these discussions would raise their hands and come and agree to come up and talk about some of the things that they've either they themselves or that they felt other people needed to unlearn. Um, and, um, and, and what you should do is click on that raise hand button. Aha, I see somebody. Who, so I'm going to bring myself down and then um, and bring uh, Nick up. Uh, I just wanted to say quickly on the unlearn side, I'm really focusing on doing professional development in bl with blended learning models. And I'm unlearning having to do the face-to-face -face part in a face-to-face -face environment. I don't want to do that. I want to do the whole thing online. And I just told Marianne, I got off an experience where we tried it. We were using Zoom, not Shindig. But, you know, typically blended learning has the brick and motor part and then the, and the technology part. Well, we we did it all online. It was really productive because of these new tech tools and because we had a set of, uh, we call them learning layouts that put people teaching and technology together online. So they got their content from that and they shared through some of the tools, the social learning tools we use to share their products and then to share as we're doing it here. So the unlearning part was saying, hey, we can be just as productive. In fact, I think the US Department of Education did a research that blended learning is equal to or better than face-to-face -face traditional learning. And I really experienced that over these last eight weeks with this group I'm working with. And I've also done it with uh, in college classes and in schools and with the corporation. And I think it has a lot of promise for the future. That's great. Um, and it's, a oh, go ahead, Nancy, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, we always find that any, you know, the blended learning that um, something face-to-face, -face, even if it's through something like Shindig or Zoom, um, but I think you need some of that that blending, right? The face-to-face -face as well as the online, but the online is so great because of the follow-up and people can work at their own pace and um, in, in whatever place they want. You know, we talk about personalized learning being the pace, the path, and the place um, that, that learning is taking place, and I think um, blended learning definitely fits into that um, by personalizing it. So I, I was really yeah, the, the, trying to redefine the term blend. It's not a blend of, uh, as I said, the brick and motor with the, uh, online learning. It's the blend of people and what they do best, nurture, facilitate, inform with technology, which processes information at the speed of light. Those are the two things you blend when you're online in and of itself. And you really take it to another level. You take personalization, you can do it that way. One to 25 sitting in a, in a classroom doesn't happen. If you really wanna unlearn something, you have to unpolicy it. You have to get out of the one to 25 teacher people ratio that exists in this country. It is a, it's the stoppage of everything. I mean, I mean, clockwork, if you just did stopwatch studies in a classroom, you can at best get a minute and a half per student at a one to 25 teacher people ratio. So who are we kidding if we're gonna yeah, say we're we that? You know, so yeah, we gotta unlearn that first the, of all. We do. And we, I mean, Nancy and I have had the benefit of, of visiting some schools that have been unlearning that. And it is exactly as you say, just so powerful. And Nick, you actually gave us a great transition into, we want to make sure tonight we share with you some other examples. And, you know, one of the things is as you look at, um, you know, that we want to make sure we think about before we get into our examples of some personalized professional learning is this idea of really understanding right, whether it's your kids, right, like you were just talking about, but also understanding where the educators are. And I think that's something that we really try to do. Like we want to move away from that two hour workshop where there isn't the follow up and the, not that that can't play a role with some other things, but that standalone workshop, one size fits all, everyone needs the same thing. How do we really build on that? And so 
We do think a lot about what is that assessment. And when we work with educators, we've actually designed different self-assessments. And I know um, Lori, I think, asked a question like, how do you make sure you don't kind of fall into, well, this is good enough and keep pushing yourself? And um, it's a wonderful question because I think, first of all, we need to really say, okay, where are all our teachers? And we know in general, they follow that wonderful curve of we have a few early adopters and a few laggards, but a lot of other people fall in right to that continuum when they're going to be ready. Um, and so once you really have a chance to kind of understand where people are, and that's something we can share some other examples, of our many models of professional learning that we've found allows you to address people at different places, um, but also to Nancy's point, lets people approach things in different ways. And so we're going to spend the next few minutes sharing a few examples that we've seen and None of these is the answer by itself, but we have seen it really shift culture in schools to focus on these. And Nancy, I almost feel remiss not starting with the idea that coaching can really support all of these across the board. So, I know, right? I guess we should have our, I think last time we had our Joyce and Showers um, slide about coaching. And um, we'll have to put that in the chat, um, that, that link, because that is such powerful. But um, I think you're right, Marianne. Coaches, um, we know how important coaches are in, in making changes and shifts to instructional practices. Um, and so that Joyce and Showers research is really important there. Um, but knowing that coaches, um, whatever form they take, it does, they don't always have the word coach in their title, but having a mentor... Um, a lead teacher, someone who is able to model lessons, somebody who is able to um, plan with teachers or curate resources and share those resources with teachers um, is crucial in, in making any shifts happen. But with that, um, knowing that, that that coach role is so important, let's dive deeper into a few of these um, other ways that we can personalize professional learning. So um, the first one um, being ed camps. And I know we were just actually, Kathy and I were talking a little bit about um, this at the onset of um, about ed camps and on conferences. Just by a show of hands, um, how many, or, or put type into the chat, have you participated in an ed camp before or an unconference? We have some fans, Nancy. Yes. Okay, great. And it looks like Marianne also put the um, the Joyce and Showers research there, which is great about coaches. So um, yes, ed camps on the next slide, you'll see so many of you all already know. So I'm preaching to the choir, but I think that, um, you know, having the ed camp, um, being able to really the participant driven, of course, free is always important, but um, I think the participant driven is a, is a key here. You know, if we go back to our Nostra's model and if teachers um, are missing the skills, letting them drive what they need to learn and, and articulate what they need to learn um, is really great. And so an ed camp can, can meet that, that need. Um, and it's collaborative. Um, there's oftentimes collaborative notes within ed camps, which is really great. Um, people are taking notes and sharing resources, um, which is super. And I think that the other important thing about ed camps that I really like is there's often this time, um, you know, you're not sitting for a long time in one session, at least the ones that I participated in and the ones we helped design um, are, you know, you have short bursts with, you know, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes on a topic, and then you have some downtime or time to process, time to maybe explore or talk with others, and then you go to the next topic. And so I think ed camps are a great way to personalize. Um, and, and for people to kind of get, get the things that they need. On the next slide, um, another model of personalized professional learning, I think, is this idea of learning walks. And I want to kind of clarify with learning walks, um, sometimes we, we think about um, learning walks as evaluative or we'll have principals who will say to us, oh, we're doing um, instructional rounds. But um, when we talk about learning walks, we really mean teachers getting into other teachers' classrooms to to observe the instruction and in a non-evaluative way. I have a principal that, that, that I work with um, and he calls it borrowing awesomeness. So um, he says, we're gonna go into the other teacher's classrooms and you're gonna see what great things, what awesome things are happening. It might be the arrangement of the furniture. It might be the, you know, the technology tool that, that the students are using. Um, 
And then we're going to come out into the hallway and we're going to share the great things we saw. And, you know, you spend maybe five to um, five to eight minutes in a classroom and then you come back in the hallway, you talk, and then you go to the next classroom. Um, but learning walks are a great way um, to spread professional learning. Kind of, um, you know, we talked about this, that oftentimes we hear just someone talking to us and learning walks allow us to actually see what's happening in a classroom. And um, then we can go back and try those things um, and, and plan with an instructional coach to maybe make some of those shifts in our practices. And so learning walks, I think, are um, a really valuable way. We know that we learn a lot from watching others, but how often do teachers get a chance to watch other teachers teach? Um, I think most of us would say it's very seldom. And so um, that idea of getting teachers into other teachers' classrooms. Marianne, anything else? And Nancy, add? well, just I think how much learning walks can build a culture where it's safe to actually share and have people coming together. Um, I did add a couple of links about ed camps and learning walks in the chat. Um, that so people can, you guys can go and look at that after the fact. But um, I do think learning walks can really change the whole conversation. Um, I've even seen a couple of schools that have had a hard time with the scheduling go ahead and do some videoing, but then they get together and they observe it and they have the same more, I guess, positive or strengths-based focused conversations. And um, and so I think there's a lot of different ways, but I remember thinking, wow, like the culture they have where teachers are comfortable with that says so much about what they'd be willing to say if they were struggling with something. So I really like that. Um, another um, example that, oh, go ahead, Nancy, sorry. I was just going to say, I think Nick was um, asking about data in a day process. Have, have we learned, use learning walks in the um, data in a day process? Marianne, are you familiar with that process? I am not familiar. Mm -mm. Um, so maybe Nick can share a little more um, with us about that data in a day. Um, Nick, do you want to come up and briefly share? Okay, or maybe Nancy, when we do our small groups, we can um, have one focused a little more on the learning walks or where we can share that. Yeah, that'll be that great. Sounds good. That, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, let's go on and share the next the um so the next slide. Okay. Um so micro credentials is another way um that we wanted um just to share with you and Micro-credentials are in some ways another name for digital badge, although we often say the micro-credential is what you have to know or be able to do. Um, you earn that credential and the digital badge is more the physical representation, but I often think it's a very interchangeable term. Um, and so we delved into micro-credentials almost four years ago. And I think um, one of the things that we've really liked about it is that it is very much that you all describe things where you had time to do something in your classroom or time to plan and then do something. And they are very action-based. And so um, we've started actually our micro-credential journey around learning differences and looking at things like how do you help that um, your students and understanding executive function, working memory, um, motivation, those kinds of things. And so, you know, just as an example, first we wanted people to learn what do those things even mean? Like, I don't think when I was a teacher, I had you know, not the in-depth understanding of working memory, which actually could have really helped me help some of my students. Um, and then with that, we also then, we kind of use almost a Bloom's taxonomy in these micro-credentials. And so the first one is really laying that foundation. That might be the first micro-credential you learn. You show that you understand what it is. But then we ask teachers to go ahead and have a conversation with a student and start to talk about that and learn about the student. What data can you collect to better understand? And then can you design a lesson or a strategy that you could work with on that student and then actually implement it? And so what we have been seeing with these micro-credentials in terms of artifacts and what teachers submit, we might get a video of them having a conversation with a student. We get work submitted to show what data they use to figure it out. Um, and I often tell people I did not start out as like a cheerleader believer in micro credentials. I was cautiously curious. Um, but after starting to see what teachers are submitting and the fact that they can work at their own pace, they're doing work in their classrooms, I've become more and more interested. And, you know, this fall, the numbers really, really spiked. I mean, we had thousands come in and it really made us realize, OK, something interesting is going on here. 
um, and how do we make sure this is robust? And so in North Carolina and in many other states, teachers can get CEUs or continuing education units for micro-credentials. Um, and so I think right now that's the carrot that is used. But at the same time, if I was a principal hiring educators and someone came to me and had done all this work on learning differences or personalized learning or using data or whatever it was that I was really concerned about, I would certainly be very excited to find a teacher that had kind of had that, you know, intrinsic motivation to seek that out. And so um, that really is, and the next slide kind of shows this is really competency based. So no longer do you just get the hours for sitting there in a seat listening. Instead, you actually have to do something. Um, and I know Nancy added several of our links. There's so many micro credentials out there now. Um, and I could talk all day and share it with you many things. So hopefully we'll get to continue that at some point. Yes. And Nancy, I know another yeah. way that we, oh, and the one thing about personalizing with micro credentials is there's so many options that you really could help a teacher hone in on where are they and what do they need and then guide them towards micro credentials that would support it. So I think it really can be a lot of teachers working on different things or partnering up to work on it. Yes. And, and I put the Digital Promise, the link, um, about micro-credentials from Digital Promise, um, and then also Kettle Marine um, District, um, a video there and talking about how they're using um, micro-credentials to transform their classroom practices. So I think like Marianne said, they are definitely personalized in that they are pace um, and because they can work at their own pace, but then also they're, um, you know, they can choose topics that they're interested. Um, so we had a question about um, how do you display your micro credentials? So that's a great question. Um, and Marian, I don't know if you, um, if you want to share a little sure. bit, but um, about how people display their micro credentials or kind of how they're using those badges. Sure. We often see them on the bottom of people's emails. Interestingly enough on people's um, resumes or CVs, they're using them on their LinkedIn profile, there's a way to share that. And they actually come with the evidence of what did you have to do to, to um, earn that. And so you really can quickly understand they are not simple. Um, we often find that about half the people that submit do not earn it the first time. And then we give feedback, which I hope is a form of coaching. Um, and then about half of those people resubmit. And so um, we do see them. And then one of the ways one of Nancy and my colleagues and a few others have done is they say teachers actually like to print them out and put them outside their door. And some schools have just really encouraged that. And then you start to say, wait, what did you earn? How did you do that? And that gets the interest of someone else. Did I miss any examples though, Nancy? You might have seen them in other places. No, I think that those are the ways that I've seen them as well. So um, yet. Yeah. Um, oh, and so there is one other question about, is there something people can do to earn um, a micro-credential for tonight? Um, you know, so I, I don't know this specifically for tonight, but there's definitely um, digital promise. Um, and Marianne, would you say to send them to digital, to um, where would you say if they were interested in maybe um, diving a little bit deeper and earning a micro-credential? Yeah, I would say digital promise. I think one of the things that, um, you know, there's several on there. I, I don't know that there's one about understanding professional learning just yet, but there are several that, that fall into different teaching strategies or even just what education um, can look like. And so we've built several around things like the four C's, around the SAMR stack, um, which Nancy might have mentioned one of our other webinars. Um, but yeah, I'll put in the um, well, you have the digital promise link, right, Nancy, up there. So I think that's a great place to go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and actually, so while you were talking, I was thinking, you know, I read your book and I learned a lot about you, the book, but I would love to be able to demonstrate to you two, okay, oh. that I read the book, I learned from it, and so I got a credential <laughs> that I am a, you know, a 21st century educator. How could I earn a credential and show that I learned um, the things that you, you know, because it's such a good book, that I learned the things that you two were writing about. Well, I love that. And I think you just challenged Nancy and I to go build micro-credentials to go with the framework. So okay. I think maybe in a couple months, we could go back to this group and let them know there is a micro-credential they could learn. I love it. Okay. 
All right. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to bring myself down because I've embarrassed myself <laughs> and my, embarrassed you enough. So sorry. No, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. So I think if we skip, um, you know, and I think we're kind of running out of a time tonight, but um, slide that um, Twitter, of course, is a great way for professional learning. Um, and we'll put the link um, to the to the list of all the chats. Of course, the Ed chat is a great Twitter chat. But um, I think that there are a lot of great Twitter chats out there. And I personally have a hard time following them as they're going on, but, um, but love to look at them afterwards and, and to kind of look through the resources there. So um, if we skip, I think, down um, to the next, to the, um, to the stoplight there, um, you know, as we kind of ran out of time and we always love to have more time to, to let you all talk to each other, but um, if we go to the next slide, just... As, as you're reflecting tonight, um, we like to use the stoplight reflection because sometimes we don't always think about what do we need to stop doing or what do we have to let go of. And um, so, you know, as you're thinking about professional learning, if you're somebody who designs it um, or is facilitating that, you know, what do we need to stop doing? Um, and then also, what do we need to reevaluate or dig a little deeper into? And then what do we need to do more of? As we're thinking about that personalizing professional learning, how are we making sure that we're building in the um, not only what the research says um, best practices are, but then, um, you know, how are we making sure that we're making those shifts and transformations? Um, Mitch mentioned our book. And so um, on the next slide, you'll see that there. Um, we also have a great opportunity this summer. Um, and, oh, and the book is available on Harvard Press as well as Amazon. Um, on the next slide, we have an opportunity, a face-to-face -face opportunity in Portland, Oregon for, um, for school leaders. And so that is leading schools. And um, we'll put the link in the chat. But if you're interested more in that, um, that's actually a personalized learning experience where each principal or um, district leader brings a problem of practice, something that they're really struggling with and um, is able to spend um, a couple of days learning more, but then also digging into their problem um, and using a design thinking approach to kind of um, to retool their school there. So that is um, an opportunity. And of course, always we love to connect. We never have enough time. Um, and so connect with Marianne and I. Um, we always appreciate Mitch and his um, insights and his humor. And so Mitch, we really appreciate you having us. Um, <laughs> Your next topic sounds really exciting. When is that next topic? Mitch? I think it's March twenty um, second. March twenty okay. second. Yes. Great. Yeah, I want to join that one. I was thinking, Mitch, I have one more quick question for you. Um, sure. We've been asked if people can get a copy of the PowerPoint, and we are pleased to share it with the group. Um, is that something you can do, or we can do, well, or how do you suggest so, that? Yeah, just send me half of Bitcoin. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm gonna. Um, I'll. Uh, I'll I, as soon as I get the right, as soon as I get the video archive, uh, which uh, Shindig uh, is is making for us, I'm gonna post the video archive and I'll post the slides up on our website, and then I'll send the link to everybody who registered for tonight, um, and I'll let you two know also because you all you all also have the email addresses of everybody. Um, who registered and you know you you can send the slides to people as well but it'll be available on the archives page of, of our website and and or you can send it to people so if people let me go back to your your twitter uh handles so if people reach out to you on twitter you can send it to them directly okay great um i went back to the to the book page because um, in very small print, I see it says you can get a 20% discount. And I, you know, on my screen, I can't read that code. What's the code? Oh, yes. Um, the, so the code is, I believe it's LP, it's um, LPDL17. So I'll put it right here. So I'll put it in here. Um, and I read the book. It's real. It really does let you know, you know, how to transform schools. You know, step by step. Why? How? When? Who do you involve? Um, how do you get people to buy into it? It's. It really is an incredibly useful book. Thank you, Mitch. We appreciate it, and thanks to all of you for joining us in the evening and our Australia friend in the morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've really all. enjoyed being with you.
Yeah, and Have and um, thank you to Nick for joining in, and uh, the rest of you. Um, you missed out by not coming up on stage, but please <laughs> uh, join us for another session. It's a lot fun up here, uh, uh, you know, talking about the topic and and sh you know sharing. And I know that you you have the same problems in your class where you're trying to get people to to participate. So uh, model model the behavior next time. Uh, but thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, Nancy and Marianne, thank you, and and thanks for doing the whole series. I think this was a great series. And um, yeah. Uh, and let, let's let's do it again. We love oh, that you know, idea. Thank you, oh. and, and you know, there was one other question that I had. How was NC ties this year? Oh, um, Nancy is the queen of NC ties. You must know it was amazing. There's a buzz I'll in the bet. whole state. I must say. <laughs> I'll bet it isn't just me. It's a whole team. It's a huge, awesome, um, all volunteer board. But we had a little over four thousand people. 4,000 yeah. people, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And more, well, I mean, Nancy, the number of teachers, but also coaches and leaders this year, like I was amazed at the principals that were really engaged as well. So it was, yeah, I loved, I loved getting to be there. And you didn't let Lucas Gillespie in, did you? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's on the board. Yeah. <laughs> Thank That's you, Mitch. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Have a great night, okay. everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Nancy. Bye, Bye, Marianne. And uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. Um, I'm uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you all March 22nd. If anybody's going to be at COSA next week, I hope to see you there. Uh, until then, or until we meet again, uh, good night.